Hi, welcome back to session one of History of World Civilizations. This is part two of session one. Now, in part one of session one, I was giving an overview of the entire course and the main points that I was making in that first part of session one were the following, that speaking of a history of world civilizations or cultures certainly makes sense in the thousands of years that preceded early modern and modern history because the cultures or civilizations of the ancient world were marked by limited technologies in terms of production and especially transportation and as a result the empires and civilizations that existed in an earlier age had very limited interactions with each other, occasionally wars between empires that were adjacent to each other, some exchanges of goods, but most of the world's cultures were very limited in terms of contact and knowledge of each other and with each other. That was going to change by the beginning of the early modern world, which I tagged at around 1200 contemporary era because this is the beginning of the age of the trading empires which use a variety of new technologies especially transportation and military technologies to create vast imperial systems or trading networks that stretch around much of the globe the Ottoman Empire the Spanish or Habsburg Empire the Portuguese Dutch etc this leads to the first significant interconnection between a wide variety of civilizations and is followed in succeeding centuries by the development of European colonialism where trading empires in many cases are converted into large colonial holdings and where the West at least for a period of a couple of hundred years comes to dominate much of the world. By the middle of the 20th century these imperial structures began to collapse and we see in the last part of the 20th century a rapid process of globalization heavily influenced by this country by the United States of America which has led to a rapid process of interaction whether it's exchange of goods information cultures between the multiple cultures of the world and the ensuing question for us will be are we getting to some kind of homogenized global culture could this just be uh, something that we'll in the future call the history of the world because there will be one global history that encompasses all humankind because cultures will have merged and values and ideas will have merged in a similar fashion those are some of the ideas we're going to be dealing with in the course is how did this process occur of gradual integration and then very rapid interactions between people by the end of the 20th century and are we headed for some kind of homogenized culture before we get there however <laughs> I want to talk about the mechanics of the course how we're going to do what in terms of things like exams, homework, all the fun stuff that'll, I'm sure, keep you absolutely entertained for the next 60 minutes or so. And this session will be, if you're watching it at some later date when it's recorded, you'll find that the first session and all succeeding sessions will be just about 75 minutes. This one will only run about 60 because we're only dealing with the mechanics. We're not dealing with substantive course issues. Okay? So if we turn to the first slide uh, to talk about some of the basics of the course. First of all, there are two essay exams. And they count for 80% of your grade. While the structure may change over time, basically the exams have been consistently over the years two essay questions you answer one. And I'll talk more about those as we get on here. But that's the basic core of the exams, two exams two questions on each exam you answer one question on each exam makes up eighty percent of your grade now in addition there are reading assignments that you will have from a textbook and from the website those will constitute essentially part of your homework and there are homework assignments which currently and again this may be altered in time but currently there are going to be two questions that you will answer 
for your homework before the midterm and two questions that you'll answer for your homework before the final exam. And those questions appear at a certain time. If you look in the syllabus, it'll tell you how soon before the exam the questions will appear on the website. So how much time you will have to actually answer those questions will be indicated on the syllabus. But those questions will appear on the website sufficiently early before the exams for you to answer those questions and submit them. And they will be essay type questions again, only shorter in nature in terms of your answer. And that's the other 20% of the grade. So it's all captured in essentially two basic grading instruments. One, two exams. Secondly, two sets of homework assignments. That's it. Now, we got to get into, all right, <laughs> How do I go about grading that stuff? <laughs> grading criteria. This is the same in all the courses I teach. If you've taken one before, you can take a five minute nap. If not, you have to stay awake. 40% of the grade is based on analysis. <laughs> Meaning what? That the kinds of questions that are asked in general, that I ask, tend to be why and how things happened, or comparative questions. A question, for example, about how did epidemic disease impact world history uh, from ancient to modern times? Okay, so the how. So you'd want to talk about, well, look, uh, the development of epidemic disease uh, devastated the population of Europe, led to certain changes in feudal structures, in the strength of the Christian church at the time. Uh, epidemic disease in the Americas destroyed 90% of the population, led to a radical restructuring of the basic racial and ethnic composition of the Western Hemisphere over the course of several hundred years. You're explaining, look, at, this is how disease affected these populations. It might be a comparative question. Uh, compare communism and fascism in the 20th century as responses to modernization. Now, if you answer that question by saying, well, look, at, here's communism over here. Uh, it erupted in places like Russia as a result of the rapid introduction of capitalism in the 19th and early 20th century. It's a, very good. And here's fascism over here. Fascism was a response to a crisis in Germany and what was already a highly developed capitalist modern society. Uh, crises involving defeat in war and depression led to fascism. Great, you're flying along. Problem is, so far I haven't compared anything. So if it's a comparative question, you have to make the answer comparative. You have to say, well look, at fascism and communism are similar in the sense they're connected in some way to the reactions of people to the process of modernization in the 20th century. They're different because they tended to erupt in different kinds of societies and cultures. Okay, now you're getting comparative. That's analytical. When you're answering why something happened, how something happened, you're comparing things, whether they're similar or different, it's not enough just to do a narrative. Just to say, well, you know, this happened, this was when communism began, this is, you know, this is who Lenin was, who Stalin was, yeah, okay, that's all great. But it's not telling me, okay, how is it similar or different to fascism? You have to be comparative or analytical, explaining how or why things go on. Now when I say 40%, it doesn't mean that the person grading the exams, who will be a grader, that that person is going to write on your exam, okay, I gave you 38 points for analysis. What it means is that in determining whether this is an A, B, C answer, the grader is going to put about 40% of weight on that aspect of it. So there won't be a precise numerical value attached to it, but that's how much weight we put on analysis, meaning it's very important. The other very important part, which is another 40%, facts. Do you provide facts to back up what you're saying? The analysis is great, but if you're not including factual information, 
to support your argument, then you're missing the other very important part of the answer. If you're going to say, for example, that, well, you know, um, disease, epidemic disease was really devastating uh, in the early modern world. Uh, lots of people died and stuff happened. Mm, that was bad, mm, very bad. Mm. Okay, that's great. But I'd like some specifics. Well, 45% of the population of Europe was destroyed, okay, by epidemic disease. The population of the Western Hemisphere was reduced by 90%. Okay, now we got some facts to illustrate just how devastating this was. And changes came about. Well, the Christian church, the Catholic church, the Church of Rome was severely weakened because uh, so many of the religious leaders, the religious bureaucrats, the priestly class were killed by the Black Death in Europe that this caused a severe weakening in the quality and power of the Christian church at that time. All right, now we got some specific facts again. So the importance of facts is not simply to string them together in some kind of narrative, but to use the facts to help justify your interpretation of how or why things happen or to make comparisons. That's the importance of facts. That's another 40%. The last 20% is composition. Hmm? meaning putting together an answer that flows logically. When you go to answer the question, it's important to think through the answer. Now I'm going to get into stuff about how to study for the exam and so forth, but before we get into those specifics, when you come to the exam and you have a relatively limited time to answer the question, it's essential to take the first few minutes and think through your answer. What are the main things I've got to cover? Write it down, you know, put it on the blue book or whatever you're using, you know. That's fine. Put a little outline down for yourself before you start answering the question. Because the other 20% has to do with, is this logically structured? In other words, you start by saying, yes, epidemic disease uh, was particularly important um, in terms of its effects on the Roman and Chinese empires of the ancient world, Europe uh, in the early modern era, and also in the Americas at that same time, uh, caused dramatic changes. And then you go into, okay, specifics. You cover the ancient world, the early modern world, and then the 20th century. Um, the Spanish flu epidemic of the early 20th century, which killed maybe 50 million people in the world and you go through those logically. And then you come to a conclusion at the end that indeed as populations have grown and as uh, systems of transportation have made the mass movement of people more practical, epidemic disease has grown in significance and impact and it has had some very devastating changes such as brief summary. So you get an introduction, cover a logical set of points, and then conclusion. That's the other 20%. Now, as far as spelling and grammar, um, I don't want to say, because it will sound bad, <laughs> that we don't count that. But we don't emphasize spelling and grammar in the sense that the grader is not focused on, did you misspell a particular word? It happens. <laughs> You get 75 minutes, uh, you won't have spell check available to you, at least not in this current format. Um, so you may misspell some words. Uh, you may improperly use a particular pronoun. The grader's not gonna worry about that either. <laughs> the only time the grader will be concerned with grammar and spelling is if it's so atrocious that the grader can't figure out what you're writing about. Uh, other than that, what we're really focused on, this is a junior level course, and our focus at this point is making sure that you can write a coherent essay, lay out a set of ideas and argument in a logical and coherent fashion and support that with some factual information. That's what we're looking for. That's a skill that you'll need, whether it's a history course and beyond history, anything, almost anything you do as a profession you know, outside of, I don't know, washing cars or something. Uh, you have to be able to do that. 
You have to be able to communicate, whether you're in sales, marketing, whatever, a school teacher, you have to be able to communicate in writing in a coherent and effective way. And that's the other 20% of the grade. Is the answer well organized? Okay? So you get 40% on analysis, 40% on facts, 20% on composition. All right, next, the website. <laughs> Although I've resisted technology for as long as I can, I do not have a cell phone. <laughs> Thank God. I've been avoiding a cell phone all my life. Um, inevitably, all of us have to integrate ourselves into the internet. So the course does have a website. And I have to say, it's really useful. Even I, who am not very good at or very accepting of technology, it really is very useful. If you look on the syllabus, you'll see the instructions for accessing the website. The website has a variety of elements to it, the most important of which are the following. One, you can access the textbook on the website if you need to. Right now, my experience has been in talking to people that 90% of students don't want to read a textbook on the web, and I agree with them. But if you need it, if you lose it, or you're out of town and you need to study for an exam, you can pull it up on the website. More importantly, the website has a set of readings. They're linked to the chapters of the textbook so that you have under course documents, you'll have chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and then in each of those, you will see document A, document B, document C. So when you look at the syllabus and see, okay, this is an assignment that says chapter one A, that means on the website, you go to chapter one and read document A, et cetera. So it gives you access to these documents, and they are a critical part of the homework assignments. That's a central part of them, okay? In addition, the homework questions themselves will appear on the website under assignments. And when it's time for the questions to pop up, they'll pop up there, okay? And they'll be before the questions come up, there'll be a little notice that'll tell you the exam questions will appear on this date and this time, et cetera. You can also use it to communicate with other people in class if you want to have a discussion session, et cetera. You can communicate with the person grading through there, but it's just as easy to go directly to the grader. The grader's email address is on the syllabus, it's just as easy to do it that way. But if you want to set up a discussion group, if you want to set up a study group, you can do that through the website. In addition, now this is something we're starting to do and I'm assuming it's going to happen. It hasn't happened at the moment because we just started recording this version of the course. But we expect that very soon and certainly for future versions of this when this is replayed, but very soon you should be able to get a live, well, I shouldn't say a live, an online stream of the course lectures. So that, again, if you miss a session in a the live version, you can go and go on the website, click on that link, and you'll actually be able to pull up whatever lecture that you didn't get or that you want to go back over. With the lectures, as you've already seen, there are all these things like this uh, oh, down there, um, outlines of comments I'm making. But of course, it doesn't have all the filler of all the stuff I'm saying about things like announcements, homework assignments, homework questions. There's none of the description. So if you find you need that, you need a refresher, you can just go back and do that. And hopefully we'll have that up soon uh, after session one is recorded. As soon as we can, we'll get that linked up so you'll be able to go back and actually see the course again, as much as you'd want to, uh, on the website. But the most important things are the readings that are linked to the textbook but are additions to the textbook. The textbook itself has a series of chapters that go over major concepts such as epidemic disease. Uh, the rise of the trading empires. And it has 
with each of those essays in the chapters, there are certain readings to go along with it. In addition, there are more readings on the website under documents, course documents that you'll see, again, chapter A, 1A, 1B, etc. So you have two sets of documents, some in the textbook, some on the website itself, and both of them supplementing the essays that constitute the major chapters. Okay, on to the next one. Homework questions themselves. As I said, before the exams, you'll see questions come up that you'll answer before the, each exam, the midterm and the final. These are currently, and I suspect for the foreseeable future, going to be 1,000 word essays, okay? Now, in talking about the exams, I was pointing out that these are essay questions, they ask questions like why and how, or compare, etc. These questions are very straightforward. The questions on the homework, they're not as let's say challenging, they're not asking you to integrate ideas, compare ideas, etc. Instead, what the homework does is simply ask you to provide an effective summary of some of the material that you've read. Whether it's a chapter in the text, a document assignment in the text, a document assignment from the web, the syllabus lays out the specifics of this for you again. But, whatever the question is, if it's a homework question that appears on the web, however it's phrased, what it's asking you for is an effective summary of this document that you've written. Okay? What are the main points the author is making? Or if it's simply a primary source document, you know, what kinds of opinions are being expressed here, etc. It's basically a summary to demonstrate, look, I read the stuff and I understood what the main points were. Okay, so we're not getting into, you're not going to be asked, well, here are you know, five different sources, compare them, etc. It will pick out specific material and say, look, summarize this material. That's the essence of those points. And that's the main task that you have for homework. This helps ensure that people are going to do the readings because you really need to do the readings. But more than that, it's also an assist to you in terms of with the exams, some people have a hard time with essay exams, with pressure exams, and these exams are both. But with the homework, it's not like you'll have an age to write these answers, but you're going to have plenty of time to write the answer, assuming that you've read the material. If you keep up with the readings, when the homework questions come up, you'll know immediately, okay, that's a question about this document that I read, and you've got plenty of time to write that summary. So this is an excellent way uh, to raise your grade, even if the ho the, uh, you're not doing so well on the exams. The homework should, if you do the readings, should help you enhance your grade. On the other hand, if you don't do the readings, you'll have a problem. You need to keep up with the reading material so that when you see the homework questions, you'll be ready to answer the question. Okay, the textbook. The textbook is an integral part of this because the textbook has been written specifically for this and several other courses. So in other words, as I designed each part of it, you'll see that, wow, you know, there's a real correlation between what he's talking about. He's talking about uh, the first few lectures are about the world as it was. Uh, the first chapter in the book is the world as it was. <laughs> so there's a close correlation. What the textbook allows me to do is to get into more detail than I can in 75 minutes on a lecture or 150 minutes, you know, 150 minutes on a topic. It sounds like a lot, and I'm sure it seems like a lot when you're sitting there listening to me, uh, but you really cannot cover a vast amount of material in only 75 or 150 minutes. So there's a close correlation between each chapter and major segments of the course. It's not like a lot of things where, okay, 
we got this textbook and I'm reading that and I have no idea how it's connected to what's going on in class. There's a very close correlation between the two. First, a major essay that sort of summarizes the main issues and things like epidemic disease, trading empires, uh, uh, the crisis of globalization, etc. An essay that summarizes the main points and then documents or articles that help support those issues, that helps you explore those issues in greater detail. Okay? So this is not just, you know, a lot of times textbooks are compilations of endless facts and your eyeballs roll to the back of your head, mm, I don't blame you. Uh, it's not that. It's not overstuffed with lots of extra things that are extraneous to the course. Almost everything in there will be, at least the assignments that you'll be reading, will be directly related to what I'm saying in class. So that's the structure of the textbook, and that is its close relationship to what's going to be going on in the class itself. Now, in addition to the textbook and the web readings, there may, depending upon when you're taking this course, be other, one other assignment, maybe another book. Hmm. With all of these materials, you're faced with reading a lot of stuff, you know, a textbook, various assigned articles, and maybe one outside book. Hmm. But that's a lot. So the question is how to master all of this stuff and not get overwhelmed by it. Uh, the first thing to do is throw out your magic marker, if you got one. <laughs> Don't use it. Um, I say that because what happens is that if you focus on you know, specific points as you go along, as you're reading, maybe 90% of the stuff is going to be new to you. If you're a history major, maybe less. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe less will be new to you. But for most people, most of the stuff is going to be new. It'd be like taking me and sending me off to, you know, take a course in physics. I don't know anything about physics. And if you say, okay, sit down and read this textbook on physics. Okay, if I sit down and read the textbook on physics and start underlining everything I don't know or didn't know, I'd underline the whole bloody book because <laughs> I don't know anything about that. And that would get me nowhere because in the end, all I've done is continuously outline, you know, or underline. It may seem like it's reassuring to keep marking stuff up, but it isn't because you're not getting the main points. What you should do is read whether it's an article or a chapter, and then try to summarize for yourself, okay, what were the main points? And if you're not sure on a couple of them, okay, look back, you know, it's not like you're cheating or anything, <laughs> just go back and look at the article. But try to summarize it after you've read it rather than worrying about, oh, oh God, do I have to remember that name or remember that name? You won't really be sure until you read the whole thing. <laughs> it's kind of like reading a novel. When you first start reading the novel, well, maybe 10 characters introduced, but how many of them are really going to be important? Are you really going to have to remember to understand the novel? Well, maybe only two of them. <laughs> so when you first start reading an article or a book or anything else that you don't know much about, you have to wait until you've read some of it before you figure out, okay, well, that's a name or an event or a phenomenon or whatever that I really do need to remember. So with everything that you're assigned to read, don't try to constantly memorize material. Now, if you get a photographic memory, congratulations, but most of us don't. Don't try to do that. Instead, try to read segments, and maybe you can only read 10, 12 pages at a time before you summarize. Okay, but read installments, and then make a short summary. Now, what about preparing for exams? How do you translate some of that into preparing for exams? Well, first of all, at the end of each segment of the course or session, I'm going to be doing a brief summary. I always summarize some of the main points. I did that at the end of the last time, and then I even repeated it at the beginning of this session. You know, sort of, what were the main things that I said? And I will continue to do that through the course, so that at the end of each major segment, there'll be a summary. What were the five, six, seven major things that I said during that lecture? When you start to study for the exam, you should be looking at the summary points first. 
go back and let's say there are six segments. I'm not saying there are. Let's say I don't know at the moment. Uh, let's say the first six sessions of the course are, up, are on the exam. Six, seven, whatever. Hmm. Go to the end of each session and look at the summary points. Then go back and flip through your notes on the whole lecture. Hmm. Because then you'll know, OK, I know it's important. Now I know what I need to remember. Just like when you do the summary on the material that you're reading, if you summarize it, then you'll know when you go back and look at it again, OK, I, I, I couldn't remember this guy's name or this fact. I know I need to remember that now because the summary told me that this is important. You know, these, this particular phenomenon was important, so I need to remember that name so I can explain that phenomena. So too, when you're studying for the exams, look at the summary points at the end of each major segment of the course, then go back and look at all the nitty gritty, the specifics, and you'll know, okay, if I remember this fact, uh, he talked about five different trading empires, but there's really two or three that are most illustrative of the kinds of things he was talking about, or this one in particular is most important, so I need to remember a few facts about that. If I'm, I'm gonna illustrate you know, what a trading empire was like, uh, whatever, okay? So the way to successfully read stuff, the way to successfully prepare for the exams is look at the end and work backwards. Hmm. Look at the bigger picture first. Hmm. That's because not only will it help you to remember the stuff you need to remember, because hmm. you won't get overwhelmed by too many facts. Hmm. You'll know, well, I remember these facts because they're important in explaining stuff. Not only will it prevent you from being overwhelmed by facts, but it'll also help you in anticipating questions. Hmm. The whole set of lectures hmm, is logically structured from beginning to end. Hmm. Okay, I just don't go along and say, oh, well, I think I'll talk about this today. How about, you know, <laughs> I'll talk about what I had for lunch yesterday. Um, I know some people do that in lectures, I don't. Um, I think through each course and the set of lectures. I don't know exactly what I'm going to say in each one, you know, before I write it all. But I write almost everything before I even give the first lecture. Mm -hmm. So I know where it's going. And each lecture is structured to cover a certain set of points and then to summarize them. So it's really highly structured. And it makes it relatively easy for people to do well as long as they figure that part out and say, well, since it's logically structured, I'll go to the end, see what he said was important about what he had to say for 75 minutes, and then I'll go back in and pick up on the information that helps illustrate what were the main points in the lecture. When I write exams, I base it on the major points that I was trying to make in the lectures. So the exam questions grow directly out of the summary points. Now I may be, you know, in an exam I may be taking like, uh, maybe there's two major lectures, one on fascism, one on communism, and I'm going to take the two of them and blend them together in some kind of comparative question. Fine, but I'm still following that logic of saying, look, here are the major points that needed to be made. So those are the points that I'm going to base the questions on. So if you know what the summary points are, you'll be able to anticipate questions. Not that I don't give you some other help, which we'll talk about in a minute, but just on your own, you can figure out, well, look, at, here are the things that he was stressing through these first five or six major sessions. So uh, logically, the questions are going to come out of those points. So the, the summary points really provide the structure, both for the lectures themselves, but also for the exams. So you'll be in good shape in anticipating that. Something else that is important to do that I mentioned a moment ago, but I'm going to mention again because it's so important, and that is outlining your answer. If you have to, well, not if you have to, you'll probably want to, you know, sit there for five minutes and just make a bullet outline like this, but even with fewer words. And now I'm going to talk about, um, again, let's go back to epidemic disease. It's, it's easy. It's about death. Uh, okay, I say, 
ancient world, major diseases, early modern world, major diseases, Europe, Americas, flu epidemic, early 20th century. Maybe you can talk about avian flu or something. Uh, 21st century. In any case, those are the major topics. Okay? And here are two or three things I want to say about each period. Now I'm ready to write the essay. I've got it outlined. Take you three minutes to do that. And now you're ready to write it. That's critical for several reasons. First of all, it'll mean that the essay will be coherently structured, which is 20% of your grade. Secondly, it'll mean that you won't get stuck writing on one topic. Let's say there are half a dozen topics logically suggested by the question. If you start writing and you haven't figured out either in your head or on a piece of paper what you're going to write about in total, you may wind up halfway through the exam period and you've only covered the first couple of points because you haven't really thought through everything else you were going to say. But if you think through in advance and organize your thoughts first, then you'll know, well, I'm halfway through, so I better be halfway through the major points that I wanted to cover. Outlining is important for both of those reasons. It keeps you from getting stuck and ensures that you'll write something that really is coherent. Okay? All right. Sample questions. I'm not going to get into specifics here. Uh, on the syllabus, there are sample questions, and they may vary over time. I'm sure they will. They always do. The important thing about the sample questions that I want to emphasize now, because it always comes up, is that the sample questions are just that. They're meant to help you anticipate answers and structure answers for yourself, but there is no guarantee that those precise questions are going to be on the exam. Okay? People come to me and say, well, I prepared for two of the sample questions and I was sure that one of them was going to be on there. They weren't. No. Uh, my point in all of this is this is a, simply an instrument to help you structure stuff. You know, that, well, I know he was talking about epidemic disease, but what kind of question would he ask? Well, there may be, maybe, a sample question on there that'll give you a pretty good idea of how would I structure the question. Now, it might be the exact same question, but there's no guarantee of that, okay? I decide just a couple of days before the exam what the questions are gonna be. The important thing is the sample questions are there to help you structure your answers and to help you structure your studying so you can figure out, okay, this is the kind of thing that he does. And very specifically, it gives you an idea of the breadth of questions that I ask. I'm only asking two questions on, let's say, six or seven sessions that run for about 150 minutes for each major session. Now, that's a lot of lectures. What I try to do with two questions is encompass as much of that material in two questions as I possibly can. So you're not going to find when you look at the sample questions or when you finally see an exam question that they're going to be narrowly focused. If you have a book outside of the textbook and the web readings assigned, if that were to be the case. I'm not going to ask you, oh, uh, what's in chapter six of the book, uh, chapter three of that book, or whatever. I'm going to ask you about the whole thing. I'm not going to take a piece from lecture two, you know, 20 minutes on uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, when I'm talking about trading empires, and ask you a question on the Ottoman Empire. I'm not because it's too narrow. The lectures are much broader than that. You know, I'm talking about the rise of these global trading networks. So yeah, the Ottoman Empire may be an important part of an answer to a question like that, but the questions are never going to be narrowly focused. You're never going to have to worry about, oh God, I couldn't remember that one. You know, he talked about six empires and I can only remember five. Oh, why worry? 
the question is never going to be so narrow that I'm going to ask you about one specific empire if I ask you about epidemic disease. Oh, tell me about you know, disease in the Americas. Hmm, don't worry about the rest of the stuff. No, no, no. Huh? It's going to be broad. Hmm. So keep in mind the breadth of the questions. On the one hand, like I said, you don't have to worry about, oh, I missed you know, 10 minutes of a lecture or I, couldn't, I can't remember at the moment that particular topic that he discussed. That's your advantage. The disadvantage is thinking broadly, <laughs> thinking globally, <laughs> that you're encompassing as much of the material as you can in these answers. And yet, you still have to support it with some factual material. Putting those two pieces together, the fact that you know the question is going to ask you some you know, broad topic, encompassing maybe centuries, five different civilizations, ecologies, or whatever. Thinking that way and also having some specific facts to support your answer. That's the combination you need. And that's why when you're studying for the exam, you start by looking at the summary points and then go back to the lectures to look at specific points so you'll keep that broad approach in mind even as you're studying. Don't, again, sit there and try to, well, I'll just read through all the notes 10 times and I'll have enough, because that won't keep you structured. The whole thing is structured, you know, with specific concepts that I'm trying to develop. So you have to study the way I build the lectures and build the course, because that's the way the exams are built. Again, these broad questions are going to ask you how, why, interpret, analyze. That's what I'm interested in. As much as, yeah, you need some facts to support your answer. The most critical thing for me is that you're thinking through the phenomena that we're looking at in the course. You know, how did this happen? Why did this happen? You know, when we talk about things like fascism, communism, it's fine to say, oh, well, it was terrible. And, you know, Stalin and Hitler, they were both crazy. Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> sure. That's the obvious. <laughs> but I don't want the obvious. I want to know, why did this happen? Hmm? You know, why do tens of millions of people throw their support enthusiastically to these kinds of movements that seem so horrendous to us as we look back in history? There's, there are reasons for that, reasons why these things happen. You know, just like Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein didn't just you know, it's, gee, you know, I think I'll go kill a few people today. And people said, oh, great, <laughs> we got a killer as a leader. Terrific. <laughs> We've been looking for. There are reasons why that kind of figure emerges and has emerged in all kinds of cultures and civilizations in the contemporary world. It isn't just, oh, well, he's a wily leader and he knocked off all his, you know, uh, potential rivals. Yeah, all of that may be true. But there are larger issues about how societies function or dysfunction. Uh, threats that people feel in the modern world, and this is one of the things we're going to be looking at is, you know, the modern world is a scary place. Mm. There are not a lot of things that you can take comfort in. The world is constantly changing. Values seem to rise and disintegrate, and people often feel highly isolated. So this leads to certain kinds of phenomena, like fascism, communism, and other things. Mm. That's the kind of point I want you to get out of looking at phenomena like communism and fascism rather than, well, Hitler was crazy. Okay, <laughs> something we all agree on. But understand why do these things happen? Terrible as they may be, why are they happening? And that's the kind of issue you should be thinking about both when I'm lecturing, but also especially when trying to answer some exam questions. And the other part that I mentioned earlier, we'll reemphasize the comparative point, which is, and here, if I ask you to compare several things, the best way to do it, let's say I ask you to compare trading empires. Take two or three of the major trading empires and compare them. OK. You want to compare, well, what were their political systems like, their economic systems? How did their trading networks function? Let's just say I'm making this up as I go along. Um, so it's not like, oh, that's a hint. <clears throat> That'll be on an exam. It's not a hint. Uh, but say I asked that, and those are some of the things you want to compare. If it's a comparative question, the way to approach it is not, 
by saying, okay, well, I'll talk about the Ottomans, I'll talk about the Spanish, I'll talk about the Portuguese, and each of those things. You're already off on the wrong track. Hmm. There's a comparative question, you say, okay, first I'll take the state systems themselves that created these empires. What were they like? And I'll compare the Ottoman system, you know, the Sultanate, uh, with the Habsburg Empire, this loosely structured monarchical system, etc. But I take that point and compare it between the different empires. And then I take, well, here's the trading networks themselves. Here's how they work. Well, see, Spain had a really land-based economic empire, silver mines in the Americas, whereas the Portuguese had a trading network of trading posts stretched around half the globe. Very different kinds of systems. Okay, you're taking the topics mentioned in the question and then using that to compare the three empires, going to the next topic, comparing the three empires, etc. That'll keep you comparative. Whereas if you separate it out and say, well, I'll talk about the Portuguese, the Ottomans, and the Spanish, you're dead. Yeah, you're dead on arrival. Because you won't be comparative in the end. You'll wind up talking about three separate empires and what they were like, but you won't really be comparing them. So keep that in mind. If it's a comparative question, look at what are you being asked to compare, focus on the, the comparative topics, and then deal with whatever the subject is, diseases, empires, or whatever. Okay, on to the next slide. Um, when you get your exams back, you'll find comments mostly at the end. Whenever I have teaching assistants, graders, uh, they are all instructed to function in this way, which is if they see something striking along the way, they may write a comment here and there on the margins. But mainly at the end of your essay, I want them to write a set of comments that make it clear to you why this is not an A exam. And I say that because if it is an A exam, then they don't have to write any comments. <laughs> They can write swell, excellent, terrific, but A pretty much says it. Okay? So you get an A, there's nothing to say except A. But if it's anything less than that, then the comments reflecting those points I made earlier about they're grading you on analysis, on facts, on the composition of the essay, those are the areas that they'll comment on and say, well, look at, you know, it's very good in terms of covering the main points suggested by the question, but there's a lack of factual information to support your answer. Or vice versa, you have a tremendous command of factual information, but you really haven't structured it in such a way that you're really answering the question, explaining how things happen, are being comparative, etc. So it's important to read the comments, especially on the midterm. Not much you can do with the final. <laughs> then it's over. But especially with the midterm, it's important to take that and read the comments, and if you need to meet with the TA, uh, the grader, whomever it is, uh, and talk about that to understand it better, <coughs> terrific. I encourage that. But the important thing is to learn from the comments that are being made. They're not being put down there just so we can justify a grade. That's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to help you so that when the final comes, you will do better because you'll know, well, if I messed up, it's because I didn't have enough factual information, I didn't think through the answer, so it wasn't coherently organized, whatever. The grading in this course, in all the courses I do, is very, very consistent. That's, I give the same lecture, <laughs> it's kind of dull, but the same basic lecture in every course because the grading system is the same in every course. That means that there's consistency between the midterm and the final. If you get a comment that says, look, it, you need to put more facts in, and you put more facts in the, the final, you'll see a difference in your grade. Hmm? Because the people who are grading the exams have been given very specific instructions. They've had to listen to the same lecture, too. They know how to do this. And that means if you respond to the fact that you had a problem in one area or another in answering the question, that correction that you make hmm? on the final will be reflected in the grade that you get. Simple as that. Hmm? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Whether it's in class, if I'm going through something after class by email, contacting the teaching assistant, you, know, you can do that most easily by email. 
you got a question, you need something clarified, go to the TA first, just because they will get back to you faster than I will, since I got 300 students, at least right now, and I usually have hundreds of students, they'll get back to you faster than I will. But if you need to talk to me, that's fine too. I have office hours, they're on, I've already explained what those are. Uh, and they'll be on the syllabus when this is a distance ed course in terms of being transmitted, but we're easy to get a hold of. Don't be afraid to ask questions and clarify things before the exam, before the homework questions come up, before all of that takes place, feel free to ask questions, okay? And explore issues with us in terms of, it isn't just, am I learning enough, but you know, you may want to explore certain issues and try to understand better some of the material that we're covering. The better you understand it, the more interested you are, and the better we answer your questions, the better you'll do on the exams. Now, last point for today. <laughs> Applause. Uh, are you in over your head? <laughs> Meaning this, that as you go along through the first half of the course, you should get a feeling for whether you're comfortable with what's happening. Do the lectures seem to make sense to you? Uh, you go over some of the readings, yeah, it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty straightforward, but that doesn't mean it necessarily is for you. If you feel that you need some help, as I just said, we're here to help you. But it may be that you feel like, look it, either because I'm just not comfortable with this material or because there are other issues that I'm having that I'm not gonna do so well in this course. <laughs> then do something about it, okay? Don't let it drag on, which so often happens that people get to the midterm. Once you take an exam, there are two exams, so once you take that midterm exam, if you get an F on it, if you are failing, then you have no choice but to stay in the course and try to bring that grade up, because I cannot give you a W under the university system uh, if you are failing the course at the time you asked to withdraw. That just can't be done. If that's supposed to be done, it can't be done. I won't do it. The other thing to think about is incompletes. Sometimes when people get into the situation where they feel, you know, it's overwhelming, if I just had some more time, you know, so can I take an incomplete and I'll take the final exam, you know, I was sick and, and you know, missed the last few weeks, et cetera. And I'm more than willing to give an incomplete to somebody who has a, you know, a reasonable explanation for why they weren't able to take the final. But you also need to be aware that under the university's policies, once you have an incomplete, you must complete. <laughs> Meaning you can't come back a month later and say, well, you know, I'm tied up with a lot of other stuff now. I, there's no way I'm gonna get back and finish going over those lectures and be able to take the final exam. It's too late. It used to be, you get an incomplete and then decide later, well, I'm not going to finish the course. I'll ask the professor for a W. Can't be done anymore. System has been changed. So now, if you're going to take an incomplete, you have to be sure that you're going to finish the course and take that exam. The point of all of this is simply look at it. If you feel that you're getting into trouble for one reason or another, talk to me, talk to the teaching assistant. And most importantly, if your own clear-headed assessment is, I'm too far behind to catch up, fine. Then take the W. But don't let yourself get into a progression where you're doing poorly on the first exam and then running into problems in the second exam. It just isn't necessary as long as you assess it. And you should get a feel, even though there are only two exams, if you go over the material and it's not making sense to you, if you have sample questions in front of you and you try out one of them and it comes out like gobbledygook, you know, you, even you can't make head or tails of it, then you know you get a problem and you need to rethink what you're doing, okay? I'm not trying to drive people out of the course. I'm more than happy to have every one of you here, but I don't want to see people get in trouble and I've seen it enough times that I want to stress this point. You know, people come to me and say, oh, well, I'd love to finish the course, but you know, that's okay. You want to take a W? That's fine, okay? That's your business. But be responsible and do it before you get into a situation where you know, you're going to damage your GPA, et cetera. So keep an eye on things, look at the sample questions, see if you feel comfortable as we go along with having to answer that kind of question. If you do, good. Okay. 
All right, we've covered all the mechanics. Next time we'll be talking about the world as it was in session two of History of World Civilizations. See you next time.